Hello and uh, welcome to Unseat Your Seat. I'm really happy that you decided to um, take a journey with me on um, learning um, some ways that you can help to unseat your seat. So why I wanted to spend some time to actually uh, do kind of like a workshop, online workshop um, covering this particular topic is because right now uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic, global pandemic, uh, if you don't already know. And um, because of that, a lot of uh, people have been severely affected um, by that. And primarily um, the people who I'm speaking to, at least for this workshop, are um, people who are working from home. Um, so whether those are single people, um, parents, um, so they're sitting a lot and then also students. And so right now it's, you know, end of August, kids are already back in school. So whether that's anywhere from uh, kindergarten all the way up to college students. And so they're also um, pretty impacted by this as well. And so there's a lot of um, sitting and sitting in front of a computer or in front of a laptop um, and doing a lot of their learning or their work. And just in the clinic, one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of patients have been saying, you know, with whatever issues that they're coming in for, um, that they've noticed that they've just been sitting a lot. And I think it's important to address, like, yes, that this is going to possibly um, be going on for a while, um, to at least help to unseat your seat and to figure out and find some ways that you can find a little bit more ease, more comfort um, with your sitting. And I, I wanna kind of take it back to a couple years ago where um, sitting was seen as like the new smoking. And I would say that's, um, maybe it was probably about five years ago when um, that particular study came out. And I think there were, ever since then, a lot of, um, you know, uh, articles and, um, you know, research papers have come out saying like, oh, no, it's not as bad as smoking, but it is, can be pretty um, detrimental to your health. And so some of the things that can be, you know, severely impacted are definitely cardiovascular um, risks, you know, will increase. Um, any type of chronic illnesses, you know, such as diabetes, um, again, cardiovascular, any type of like heart conditions as well, cancer mortality also goes up. And then if you are already someone with some type of systemic or chronic illness, then that's going to get exacerbated even more um, with that continued sitting and lack of movement. And then, you know, as that study came out, then everyone's like, okay, we're gonna stand and standing workstations, but that's not as good either. Because you also don't wanna be standing for eight hours straight, because then that's not good um, for your body as well either. Um, we're meant to move and we're meant to vary up our positions and vary up how we're standing, how we're sitting. And so that's something I want to be able to invite you to go and do um, with this. So um, I'm gonna, in the second part of this, like it's a mini lecture, I'll do kind of a little bit of a short anatomy lesson to look at three specific, three specific, three specific areas um, that I will be addressing with the second half of this workshop, which will be more of the movement base. Um, so specifically looking at um, back, the back. Um, one of the things I also forgot to mention is like back pain, like that's one of the biggest things um, that a lot of um, those who with continued sitting, um, that, that's one of the issues that we definitely tend to see. One of the diagnoses is um, back pain, especially chronic back pain. And that's actually one of the biggest um, causes for a lot of people calling in sick you know, from work is because of um, chronic back pain issues. And it can be pretty debilitating for um, a lot of folks. So if there are some ways that we can help to mitigate that, then I think that's gonna be better than nothing at all or you know um, the alternative which should be like medication or surgery down the road so um, as i was saying before that i will be focusing on looking at the back so we'll look at some of the anatomical structures of the back um, then we will also look at the muscles around the hips as well as the pelvis and then lastly we'll also look at the pelvic floor um, so we'll spend a little bit of some time just talking about, um, you know, there's particular uh, different structures. I'm not going to go too much into depth because, um, again, uh, I want this, this is primarily uh, a movement-based uh, workshop. 
and I want to be able to provide some different ways that you can be able to move um, or prepare your body um, for having to sit if you have to sit for a long period of time. So whether that's like first thing in the morning um, before you get out of bed. So I have um, a practice that you can do right in bed. Um, I have a practice that you can do while you're sitting in your chair. So if you don't have the space or the time to like get down on the ground, then there are some really great stretches, movements that you can do um, just while you're sitting in your chair. So I'll provide that for you. And then lastly, if you do have the time and you do have the space in order to actually get down on the ground, um, also have a really nice movement practice that you can um, work with as well. So this is meant to be, um, it's not a, a class, um, hopefully that with each one that you see that there might be like one or two things that you take away from it and you know do it and then integrate it as part of your everyday because I feel like yes all this information is really helpful and you do the workshop and that's great and then you forget about it so the biggest thing is that like even if you can just take away one or two exercises that you can try to do every single day it's gonna you know work wonders for you um, and I will also let you know um, about uh, Katie Bowman, who is a really great, I, I talk about her in um, one of the movement videos. Uh, she's a really great biomechanical scientist, um, has written a plethora of books around movement. And if you go onto her website, she actually has um, a really great poster. I didn't want to uh, recreate something like that because I think that what she offers is like way better than what I could offer. But I, um, I think it's how to like think outside the chair. And so if you are having to sit, like hopefully I'm sitting right now and you've already seen me kind of maybe move my body in like three different ways. Um, but it's really about variability and that you're varying your movements. As I mentioned, you know, sitting isn't all that bad. Like with some things you do have to sit and it is a necessary thing. It's a position of rest for sure. Um, but where the, the bad part about sitting comes with staying in a constant um, static position and you're not bearing up your movement. It's the same thing if you're gonna be standing. So standing is not a bad thing either. It's actually really helpful, but you should be like sitting, you know, standing you know, changing up your position of how you're sitting so that it's crossing, you know, the other leg over the other and not always doing your, your um, same constant movement all the time. So variability is key and that's where I think you're going to find a lot more bang for your buck and a lot more benefit when it comes to um, having to endure sitting for long periods of time. Um, so I'm focusing mostly just along this lower part of the area. I don't spend too much time talking about um, the thoracic spine or the mid back or the shoulders or the head or the neck. That might be something that I might um, tackle on another time. But I um, wanted to kind of really uh, tackle this particular area like for unseating your seat. So um, you can uh, then head on over to the anatomy um, portion where it'll take about like 10 minutes just to go and talk about some of the structures um, and why it's important and why I'm focusing on that. And then um, definitely hop on to some of the movement videos so you can start to find some ways that you can help unsafe your seat. Hi. All right, so I have here um, my friend, I'm at the clinic, so I um, have a full body skeleton that I'm gonna use to do a little bit of some demonstration. So, uh, again, I wanted to point out that, so I'm going to be looking at three particular areas of the body. So the first is going to be the back. And so I will turn this around. Let me turn this around. Right. So in regards to the back, especially um, the low back, so you can see, um, hopefully you can see this on the side, just, um, and again, it's not going to be anatomically correct, but that we do have a natural curve um, that's present in our back and especially along the low back is what we have what we call a lordosis so there's a little bit of a curvature so um, this part is going to be a little bit more sunken in but what happens um, especially um, from poor posture um, when sitting so if I were to bring um, the legs up so they go, the legs go up into flexion, if you can see here, so I'm just like to show on this one. So this leg goes up into flexion, 
And so for someone who might be really tight um, through their hamstrings or, you know, just weak in some areas, tight in some areas, one of the things that can happen is that it can end up pulling this um, pelvic bone. Um, it actually would go backwards. And so it would actually be more in a more um, tucked position. And so what happens is that then it causes this lordosis, um, that particular part of the spine, instead of having um, the nice length that it should have, it actually will create a lot of compression. A lot of the compression will actually be seen here more along the anterior or the front part of um, the lumbar vertebrae. And so that's, you know, essentially like when you're in that position for a long period of time, that's where you can potentially see like bulging discs, um, for example. But, you know, before it ever comes to that um, point, one of the things that you will notice is um, compared to, you know, sitting, um, lying down, uh, standing. So thinking about the different load that's applied in that particular area. So there's definitely more load that's going to be applied to the vertebrae and specifically to um, these discs when you're sitting. Um, and then, like, if you're lying down, then you're giving a chance for um, a lot more space and almost like a traction in a way. So you're allowing for a little bit more space um, in between those intervertebral um, discs. And then when you're in standing, um, that's also going to be different. So it's a little bit of a lesser load. Um, but then when you're sitting, and then especially if you're sitting in that slump position, you're just increasing the amount of load that's there. So it's going to be really important that obviously we're addressing what's going on in the back. Um, in one of the videos, um, I don't remember which one it is, but in one of the videos I show um, a way that you can do some self-tractioning around this area, especially if you spend a lot of time sitting. That way you can work on trying to undo or create a little bit more length rather than everything being compressed and shortened um, in this, uh, in this um, lumbar um, spine area. So that's one area that is important to um, focus on, especially uh, for the low back. Another thing that we want to look at, I just want to see how it's positioned, so let me turn this around. Okay, so we're bringing the skeleton back to the front, um, are gonna be the hamstrings. Sorry, I'm turning them back to the, the back of the skeleton. So actually the hamstrings. So hamstrings, if you didn't know, so they actually attach along your ischial tuberosity, or what we call the sit bone. So they have attachments right um, along there, and then they actually attach, if I can bring this up, so we're kind of, not, no one is, leg is able to go into that much extension, um, but then they actually attach, you know, from your ischial tuberosity and actually down towards um, the back of your tibia, as opposed to your part of your tibia. So it's a pretty long distance um, that they go towards. And so, as I mentioned um, before, actually I talk about it in one of the videos, that just from all of that sitting, so you're in this position, and then that knee is bent, if you can see here. So if you're in hip flexion and then knee flexion, then those hamstring muscles, they have a tendency to go and shorten a lot. So it's important that um, we can help to undo that. Obviously, stretching out those muscles are really helpful, but one of the things that could happen is that if those muscles are tight, they might be tight for a reason. Yes, it could be muscular tightness, but also because they need to be protected for some particular reason. And so one of the things that we will also see is the adductors. So the inner thigh muscles um, will also have um, some level of tightness, can also have some level of weakness as well. And so those adductor muscles they actually have attachments just along the lesser trochanter. Let me see if I can. Oh, I have a treatment table right behind me, so I can't really back it up too much. Um, but along the lesser trochanter, so it's a little bit hard to palpate. You know, you have a lot of muscles in there, but the adductors, you know, just um, they attach along here. They also attach along um, the pubic bone. So, and then all the way. Um, towards the lower end of the femur bone as well too. So lots of muscles that um, attach there. And so there could be a particular level of weakness that can be present um, in those spaces. And in addition, so hip flexors, um, and most of us tend to be pretty tight, especially along the hip flexors. 
again in one of the videos I spent some time looking at hip extension because if we're spending so much time sitting in those areas again they tend to get compressed they get shortened um, it's important that we spend some time to also lengthen those tissues so opening up um, the hip flexor area um, working on some length as well as strength of these adductor muscles are also going to be key as well and so you know looking at all of um, those muscles so muscles play a really big part but also the joints you know can also be limiting a lot of movement as well too and so I like to you know use an analogy of like if you had like a pair of pliers so pliers um, or almost like scissors, so you, know, you need to be able to open and close it in order to be able to do whatever that function of like cutting or whatever you do with pliers. Um, but then if they've been sitting you know, outside in the rain and then they get really rusty and then you try to open it and close it, then it takes some time. It you know, might get you know, really, really stuck and it might catch a little bit. It's not gonna flow as smoothly as like, you know, compared to something that is like a brand new pair of scissors or pliers. So it's gonna feel like really stuck. Um, so that, you know, taking that same analogy, you can take that into what's going on in um, your hip joint as well too. So inside, so you have this um, hip bone and I know there's lots of muscles that might be kind of covering it, but then you might be able to see in here is your acetabulum so um, it's almost like a little bowl and then you have the head of your femur bone which is right over here and that sits inside of that acetabulum and it, it's just like a nice ball and socket joint and needs to be able to move and slide and glide you know fairly well in order to be able to have all of those ranges of motion like hip flexion extension abduction adduction any type of internal external rotation so that's really important so um, if we're very limited, if it's kind of um, rusty <laughs> in that area, then it's gonna make it really difficult um, for you to get into any other position. Um, and then if you're just spending a lot of time in hip flexion all the time from sitting, then being able to do any of those other motions that are required more for like optimal um, hip mobility is gonna be really, really hard. Um, because of what's happening inside of that hip and then also those muscles will also feed off of that and then they're also going to be just really stiff, really, um, you know, almost like dehydrated and, and dry and not be able to move as well and then also some of the muscles might be weak just because they haven't been used. So we want to look at the muscles but also see um, what's happening with the bones as well too just as we did with the lumbar vertebrae. Um, the bones of that hip joint can also be negatively impacted from a lot of static sitting and not a lot of variability with um, your sitting position and your movement. And so lastly, the last thing is gonna be the pelvic floor. Usually I have my um, pelvic floor model, I don't have that with me um, today, but um, you can see here in this picture, so you have this pelvic bowl, and then we have the pubic bone, and then you have here um, the tailbone, or the coccyx. And so, right in between those two areas again this is not anatomically correct because it wouldn't be sitting so far forward it actually would be tipping back just a little bit but the pelvic floor muscles they have um, attachment along that coccyx all the way towards the pubic bone as well as on either side of um, the ischial tuberosity as well and so any malpositioning bad positioning that's happening in that pelvis, you know, from poor posture, then that's gonna have a big impact on the pelvic floor muscles as well. Um, usually you might have like heard of the cueing to make sure that you're sitting on your six bones, you don't wanna be sitting on your tailbone. Almost what happens sometimes is that people will actually be sitting more on their tailbones instead of on their six bones. And then what can occur is it can be either two things, it's never just like one thing that happens. Um, there, there definitely could be, you know, um, tightening of those pelvic floor muscles. So they're shortening, um, so they have pelvic floor muscles right here. So here would be like where the tailbone attaches and here would be where the pubic bone attaches. So then if I'm constantly sitting on my sits bones all the time, then there might actually be um, tightening of, actually sorry, lengthening, I would say probably lengthening of muscles, you know, towards the back. There could be tightening of the muscles in the front or it can be the opposite. There could be tightness of muscles along the back, posterior part of the pelvic floor muscles and then lengthening here. So 
you know, everybody's different and everyone has different um, anatomy, so it's never going to be one thing or the other. But one thing that you definitely will find are going to be some trigger points. Um, so with one of the exercise videos and the floor-based exercises, we go through uh, a pelvic floor self-massage that you're going to be doing just along the perineum, and it will have a really great impact on all the pelvic floor muscles. So it's important to also address and see what is going on with the pelvic floor. Again, because the focus isn't on um, pelvic floor per se um, with this uh, workshop, but I wanted to at least talk about it a little bit because it does have a really big impact. And obviously if there is any type of um, issue with those pelvic floor muscles, um, whether it's tightness, um, whether it's weakness, whether it's motor control, the muscles aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, then not only is it impacting you when you're sitting, but also when, um, whether it's, you know, sexual function, whether it's, you know, bowel and bladder function. Um, again, you have all of the, you have all, a lot of vascular um, structures um, that run through this area. So whether it's arteries, veins, um, lymph, and, and nerves as well too. So then that constant um, hip flexion, um, sitting in that area for a long period of time, not allowing for any variability or dynamic movements and there can also be a lot of congestion that will also have an impact on the pelvic floor and so hopefully a little bit of an anatomy lesson so we have a better understanding of um, un helping you to unseat your seat um, so definitely go ahead check out those um, three exercises so one's a floor base one's a chair base and then one is something that you can do um, in bed as well and yeah, let me know how those go for you. All right. Hi, and welcome to the first part of this unseat your seat practice. So as I mentioned in the first video, the introductory video, that was kind of like the lecture. Um, so it's gonna be three parts to it, but the nice thing is that you can choose. So there's gonna be a floor based um, 15, 20 minute practice there's going to be a chair-based practice, and then there's also going to be one that you can do in your bed. Uh, I'm going to be showing it on a massage table, so you'll see that um, in the second part. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have three uh, offerings, three things that you can choose from to help unseat your seat. So what you're going to need for this first part for the floor-based practice, so you'll need a set of yoga tuna falls. We're only going to use one of them, and that will be towards the end. And then you'll also need uh, a red TheraBand. So if you have a stretchy, long TheraBand, you're just gonna tie them at either end just so that you have some loops. We're gonna be putting our feet through them. So that will be helpful um, for you to have already and set to go. So I also have my notes, so I will be referring to them as needed so I make sure that I'm not forgetting any um, part of the sequence. So as I mentioned, so this is something that you can do to help unseat your seat. So a lot of it's gonna be um, back focused, it also will be core focused. It will be looking at the muscles um, in your legs, so the hamstrings, your adductors, so the inner thigh muscles, your glutes, and then lastly, we'll also look at the pelvic floor. And as I mentioned during the lecture, like those are three main areas that are affected from just constant sitting. So we'll have a little practice so we can explore that. So what you're gonna start off is you want to make sure um, you're sitting on a yoga mat. So first thing that we're gonna do is an exercise called click clack. So I learned this from Katie Bowman, who is a biomechanical scientist, and she does a really great job of talking about the biomechanics of the human body. So if you don't know of her, highly recommend um, you check her out. Um, but this particular exercise, click clack, is a great way, and I, I guess it could only almost be seen as like pelvic tilts. I'll show a, a version that you can do when you're lying down, but this is one that you can do when you're sitting. So you can do this whether you're sitting in a chair or you can also do this um, when you're lying or when you're actually sitting on the ground. So I'm gonna just turn to the side so you can see. So what you're gonna start off doing is you're gonna be um, seated and you want to feel for your sits bones. So you're gonna have your sits bones underneath you. You can place your hands on top of your knees and all you're gonna be doing is we're going back into a posterior pelvic tilt and then moving forward into an anterior tilt. So I think the reason why she calls it click clack is, you know, is that if you're moving back and forth that you can actually, it, you can hear kind of like a little bit of a sound because, you know, you're moving a lot of um, the muscles right over the cyst bones or over the ischial tuberosity. So it's called click clack there. 
So I just want you to do this movement. It's just something nice that you can do just for like a minute, you know, two minutes, especially if you've been doing a lot of sitting and maybe kind of staying in one fixed position just to kind of get yourself or at least getting that pelvis to be moving in some different positions. So that's one option is to do this clip clap position. Um, next, you can also do this lying down. So then you'll lie flat on your back and you're not gonna feel for the movement of your sits bones per se, but you can actually feel for the movement of your pelvis, which is what you were feeling when you were sitting upright. So then you can have your hands resting um, on your thighs. You can also have them resting right on your hip bones as well too. And so then I like to, so especially for those who are really tight or don't have a good sense of, you know, the, the movement or body awareness of what their pelvis is doing or what their hips are doing, then it's helpful to use your feet. So your feet can help to drive the movement. So with your hands on um, your hip bones or your ASIS, you're going to use your feet. So your feet are going to push away from you. So you can almost think like your feet are glued to your yoga mat or there's, you know, um, uh, like sticky glue um, and you can't actually move your feet but you're trying to move it. So as you do that, you try to move your feet away from you, it's gonna push you into a posterior pelvic tilt. <laughs> Sorry, my cat Coco is here. Um, and then you can try to pull your feet towards your body or towards your butt, that's gonna move you into an anterior pelvic tilt. So you're gonna be moving back and forth between posterior and anterior pelvic tilt. So again, same movement that we were doing when we were upright, it's just that you're not on your six bones but it um, might be a little bit more gentle or um, a foundational pose that you can start off with in order to kind of get a sense of what your pelvis should be doing and how it can move and that it can move in these two different ways. Most of us tend to be in one position. And then, you know, when you get a sense like, okay, yes, I can feel for that movement around pelvis, then you can find where neutral is. We're not gonna spend too much time like doing exercises in neutral, um, in other workshops that I'll be leading, then this is a great exercise that you can start off with in order for you to then find neutral, so it's somewhere in the middle, okay? So then you can do that again for a minute. Again, this option, pelvic tilt, or the one where um, you're sitting upright and doing that clip clap, clip clap, clip clap, okay? So what you're gonna do next is you're gonna come into, let me double check, all right, so you're going to come into a long sitting position. So I like to do this a little bit of a flow just so you can, again, um, incorporate the breath uh, as we're moving. And then also start to talk to the arms, talk to the shoulders, talk to the rest of the fascial connection all the way up um, through the spine. So thoracolumbar fascia has definitely a lot of connections all the way up into the latissimus dorsi, which then also helps with that movement of that's going on um, in the arms and the shoulders. So we'll be combining the breath, it'll be a little bit of a fluid movement, okay? So what you're gonna start off with doing is you're gonna be inhaling as you draw the arms up, and then exhale as you come forward. And then inhale, you're gonna round your back, and draw the arms along the sides of the body, and then you're back to your starting position, okay? So again, you're inhaling, so here's where you're gonna find your neutral, and you should feel your sits bones right underneath you. So you're starting off in neutral, arms inhale to lift up. And then exhale as you fall forward. You might even feel a little bit of an anterior tilt, so your pelvic bowl is going forward. And then you're gonna draw the arms back, a little bit of a posterior pelvic tilt, pelvis is moving backwards. And then you're back to your starting position. So I'm gonna just move through it a couple of times without talking. Okay, so if you are really tight in your hamstrings and getting into that forward fold position doesn't feel attainable, you can always bend your knees. You can have a little bit of a bolster or a pillow underneath you. So I'll show with the knees slightly bent, especially if those hamstrings are tight. Okay. 
Okay. So again, because this is just something that you can do. So if you're able to find 15, 20 minutes, you know, during your day, especially if you're having to sit a lot to take, you know, to get down on the ground and do this practice, doesn't take too long. So maybe doing it for about two minutes. Um, and then again, combining that breath, especially if you're having to like sit at work and if it's just your, you know, your stretch break, um, maybe before uh, you get back to sit back at your desk right after lunch and just to get a little bit of some breath moving just to kind of allow your body to center it's really something um, very powerful to do just to combine that breath with that movement as well a very simple movement but can be super super effective okay so what we'll do next is then we're going to come into a cross leg position so now i'm going to be facing you okay so i'm going to break this up into uh, what it looks like and then Again, because I like fluid movements, because um, when we move through life, we're not like super linear and very choppy. You know, the movement, a lot of our movements tend to be pretty fluid. And I like to almost think of it almost like a dance as well. And then you put that dance and also with that breath. So it was not something that you're used to or, um, you know, for me, like choreography is super, super hard for me. Like I love dance and I love dancing, but when it comes to any type of choreography, then I freak out. and. I mess up with the steps, but then when I'm allowing myself just to kind of move with the rhythm, move with the timing of the music, move with my breath, then it's a lot more fluid and I have a lot more fun. So I want this to also be fun. Again, it's a really simple movement, it's not too hard, but I want you to invite more fluidity um, with your movements, okay? So especially um, if you're used to doing like a vinyasa or flow style type of practice, this is not, you know, uh, necessarily like yoga practice. It's just like um, a movement break for you, but there can also be fluidity um, with it as well. So you'll be sitting in a cross-legged position. So what you're going to do, so we're going to be moving through the sides of the body. So as I mentioned through the lecture, uh, we're going to be attacking or not, not so much attacking, but we'll be addressing the quadratus lumborum. So some two of those um, side back muscles that help, that are pretty much constantly on every time that we're in an upright um, position. So we're gonna take some time to go and stretch as well as to move. Um, and then also a little bit of rotation as well too. Um, most people tend to like throw out their backs anytime that they do any type of rotation as well as a forward bend. So it's not saying that we need to avoid those movements. It's important that we can be able to go into those movements. The more that we do it, the more that our body is used to those movements and then those less opportunities for our back to get thrown out. So when we avoid movements, then that's when that's pretty much a recipe for um, a type of injury to occur. So we, we're spending a lot of time talking about like variability of movement, especially variability of sitting. So there should be variability of movement all the time that you, every time you're picking something up, it shouldn't always just always be in that same position. You should also be able to do it in lots of different positions, even if it requires for you to rotate and then bend forward, okay? So what we're gonna do with this, again, it's gonna be really nice and gentle. So we'll start off, left hand is gonna be placed um, on your right knee. And I want kind of like a pulling action. So it's almost like you're trying to pull your knee. The knee isn't going to be lifting up or going anywhere. It's still going to stay grounded. You want to still make sure that you feel your sits bones grounded onto the floor. But you're going to create a little bit of a pulling action. So as that left hand pulls on that right knee, then you're going to allow your body to pour all the way over towards the left. And then you can hang out here for a couple, at least, you know, two cycles of breath. So an inhale and an exhale should be feeling the right side of your torso lengthening here. And then we'll inhale to bring ourselves back up. So as you come back up, we spend some time to the length in here. So I don't want you to like whip yourself back up, but there should be an engagement of all of those oblique muscles as you come back up. And then we'll switch. And then that right hand will come on towards that left knee. And again, just like a teapot, we'll slowly pour ourselves over pulling for a cycle or two. So I mentioned, so this is a side bend. There can be a little bit of rotation, so it feels comfortable for you. So as you're holding here, you're creating a little bit of pull, and then you're thinking of, instead of that torso you know, facing downward, you're thinking of allowing that torso to rotate upwards. So then you're getting a little bit of that rotation as well. Okay, and then you can release and then switch. So I'm just gonna move through it as I slowly move into a little fluid movement that I mentioned. So I'm going more like with an inhale and an exhale. So just um, a one cycle breath here. 
and then I cross the arms and then to the other side and then cross the arms and to the other side. So you can use your exhale as you come into that side bend, the inhale as you come forward, exhale, side bend, maybe a little bit of rotation, and then inhale, come forward, and exhale. And then it can flow. Okay, so that's a really nice way just to kind of warm up, open up um, the sides of the body, especially if everything has just been kind of feeling very, very stagnant. So it's important, again, to make sure that as you're doing this, to make sure that you feel for um, your chest bone staying grounded the whole entire time. All right, so after that, so we did a little bit of the side stretch. So what we're going to do next is you're going to um, kind of move into the legs now. So you're going to use your um, red TheraBand. So if you have any color, it's fine. Um, red is usually a light to medium, more on the medium side um, resistance that you want to work with. So you're going to place the two loops um, over your feet. Okay. So what you're going to do here is you want to have a little bit of some tension here. Okay. So I wanted to do a before and an after. So when you're spending a lot of time um, sitting at your desk, um, depending on what your setup is, whether you have an ergonomic chair, a regular chair, whatever that may be, you're spending a lot of time obviously with your hips flexed and then with those knees bent, so there's also flexion there. So when you're having that flexion here in your hips and then also flexion in your knees, then that's causing a lot of your hamstring muscles to shorten as well as tighten. And then if you're spending gosh, like, you know, if you're working at your um, workstation for, you know, maybe eight hours a day and you're not getting up very often in order to get up, move around and stuff, and you're doing that periodically over a set amount of time, those uh, hamstring muscles continue to contract and shorten. And sometimes you might be wondering like, oh, you know, I do all this yoga and um, I stretch my hamstrings, but they still never, they still are always tight. So, like I mentioned before, it's always important to look at what's going on with the pelvis. Um, they could be tight because they're tight, but also they could be tight because there might be some weakness in some other areas. And so those hamstring muscles are working really, really hard in order to go and protect. So there could be a, a matter of tightness just because of you know, muscular tightness, or it also it's doing it because the nervous system is what rules the musculoskeletal system. And so the nervous system is queen. So um, the, the muscles will listen to what the nervous system says. And so if there is, you know, whatever might be going on, if there's some, you know, a weakness, a dysfunction, any type of issue, you know, anywhere in the body, then those hamstring muscles might be tightening and contracting in order to create some type of protection. So it's important to also address and look at that. So what I wanted to do is a before and after. So actually I'll show on the side. So what are you gonna start off with? Is just do a regular forward fold. We already did this earlier, so maybe you can at least kind of get a sense of where your hamstring length is. So making sure that your sits bones are staying firm on the ground. So you can just walk your hands forward to whatever feels comfortable for you and just get a sense of on your hamstring length, okay? So when you're doing this, it's not where the back is rounding because then you're actually creating spinal flexion. You're not actually moving through the hip joint in order to assess um, hamstring length, okay? Um, so you wanna make sure that you're moving through the hips, not through your spine, right? So just noticing where you're at, maybe if you're able to reach towards your ankles, maybe your toes, maybe you can wrap your, your, um, your hands around, just noticing that, okay? And then also just being aware of, you know, do you have any type of pulling? You know, do your feet turn out? Just notice what um, occurs there, okay? And then we're gonna do this exercise, and then you can also, we'll do an after test and then just see if there have been any changes. Some people might notice some changes, some people might not, but um, I think it's always really important to always kind of do like an assessment of where you are in your body. So as I mentioned, so you wanna keep a little bit of some tension here. So what you're gonna do, so again, we're sitting on the cis bones, so now we're gonna be incorporating the core. 
So we want to keep our, make sure that again, that we're grounded, that our sits bones are pretty firm in towards the floor. And we're going to keep this tension here. And then as we engage that core, like it reflexively wants to turn on. It shouldn't be like, okay, now I'm going to turn on my core muscles. So it should know like, okay, I'm going to start to lift my right leg up. Okay. My body needs to stabilize in order for me to move that right leg out to the side. Same thing, because now there's more resistance that I'm applying and more tension, okay? So I'm continuing to keep that core engaged. I'm still staying on my sits bones, and then I'm walking my legs up. Might not be able to walk them that far up. So as I'm doing this motion, I'm turning on all of my abductors or my abductors, so those muscles that help me to um, pull my legs apart. So you might start to feel those muscles turning on and then you can start to walk them in. So if this is really challenging for you, if you feel like you can um, stay up on your sits bones while you're doing this, have your hands um, out to the side. So I'll just have my hand out to the side just to demonstrate. And then I'll walk my hand, or sorry, my feet. I'll walk my feet back in, okay? And then I'll walk them out. So even if you have your hands to help um, support you as an anchor, you should still feel core muscles, leg muscles doing some work here as well. So make sure as much as possible, hopefully I'm doing a good job demonstrating that you're not allowing those legs to slide. So you should be walking in. You can walk them all the way in if you want, and then walking them all the way out. So as I'm walking the legs out, outer thigh muscles are working, core is definitely working. As I walk them in, the inner thigh muscles are working. So I definitely feel those muscles working as well. And so, I love this exercise and especially adding some resistance because we tend to spend a lot of time working um, on lengthening hamstrings. Uh, I think, I feel like, you know, in most exercise programs and yoga, you know, working on the outer um, hip muscles, but not too much on the inner thigh. And then on the inner thigh, yes, maybe to stretch, but not really to strengthen. And so again, as I mentioned, hamstring length, you know, also want to look at what's going on with the adductors. They share a fascial relationship there. So noticing maybe it's not just a matter of stretching your hamstrings or even stretching your adductors. Maybe those muscles need to get a little bit stronger. Okay. So after doing this, if it feels like it's getting a little bit easier, you can take the hands out. See if you can then really work with your um, stability, your core stability, and still making sure that you're on your sits bones and doing that in and out, okay? So you can do, you know, about like five in, five out. A great way just to kind of warm up um, your body, especially if um, they're feeling just kind of like really tired and or tired or just they haven't been, really been moving. It's a great way just to kind of get blood flowing, turn some muscles on, warm um warm up that part of your body your lower extremity and then afterwards then you can come back into that forward fold and just notice are you able to go a little bit further a little bit deeper maybe you're not feeling that initial tension that pull that you had before because now there's a little bit more symmetry now there's a little bit more balance um, with regards to those muscles all right so second to last um uh exercise that you can incorporate into this little flow is you can continue to keep the um, red TheraBand on. So what we're gonna play now with is external internal rotation of your hips, okay? And I like to do this with, again, some resistance. So I'm gonna show kind of an easy. Um, most people, at least from what I've noticed like clinically, is most patients that I see, they tend to be very good when it comes to external rotation, not much movement when it comes to internal rotation. So I like this, I'm adding a little bit of resistance so that way there's a little bit of pull, a little bit of play, okay? Um, so that way as one leg is going into external rotation, the other one is put, causing me to go into internal rotation as well too. I have a lot of internal rotation. So what you do might not look very similar to what I'm doing, okay? So the leg should just be out to a V, doesn't have to be into your widest um, leg position. And you're just gonna be doing an alternating back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so you can do this again about five times if you'd like. And then you're gonna keep both of the legs so toes are pointing up and now you're gonna be going into external rotation with both feet. 
okay? Or actually with both legs, because it's the whole leg, that whole chain, okay? And then moving into internal rotation. So moving into the external rotation. And again, I feel like with external rotation, again, people are pretty good with external rotation. You know, maybe they just kind of like flop into it or fall into it. But can you actively bring yourself into external rotation? So as I do this, I really feel all of those outer hip muscles, my eviductor muscles working. And I know that I have, um, it's harder for me to go into external rotation on one side compared to the other. So I really feel it more so on my right leg compared to my left, okay? And then again, internal rotation is fairly easy for me. So, you know, again, just something for you to play with. But then I want you to really feel for not just those muscles, but more so the bones. Feeling for, because again, as you're going into internal external rotation, you're thinking of the head of that femur bone moving inside of that acetabulum, moving back and forth. So it should, there shouldn't be any kind of grinding or crunching. It should be nice and smooth and pretty fluid. And I like this a lot because it's, I am, it's almost like a, it's an active flexibility exercise. So I'm not just, you know, allowing myself to flop into it or forcing or pushing myself into it. I'm having to use some tension. I'm having to use some resistance and, and muscle energy as well in order to bring myself into these positions so that my, my muscles have to work a little, they have to work hard in order for me to get into these positions, but then that's going to be a lot more safer. It's going to be a lot more, um, I guess like more, it's just going to be a lot more, I guess, confident, you know, for my body rather than um, just relying on, especially if you're like a loosey goosey. So I'm not relying on my ligaments to do the work. I'm relying on feeling for the bones moving and also relying on the efficiency of the muscles as well too. Okay. And again, um, you can choose to do this for like about a minute, two minutes. Again, this is like a 15, 20 minute little um, flow exercise, exercise, a flow of exercises that you can choose to do, especially um, when you have um, your break um, at work when you're at home. <laughs> so the last thing that you're going to do is now you're going to take your yoga tune-up ball. So we're not doing too much because uh, I want to, again, this is like just a really short um, flow, but then you're spending a lot of time sitting and it's important to look at the pelvic floor. So when you are in um, this position, so when you're, uh, you know, pretty much posteriorly rotated here, um, then you're pretty much sitting on your tailbone. You're not sitting on your sits bones. There's going to be uh, some pull, you know, on those pelvic floor muscles. And then some areas where they're not going to be, it's not going to be in a, in a congruent position. It's not going to be the most um, efficient for those pelvic floor muscles to be able to react, behave, whatever it, it is that it needs to go and do when it's in not an optimal position. So we want to talk to some of those muscles. And as I mentioned in the lecture that you might notice um, some trigger points, you know, in some areas, especially where there might be some areas of tension. So we're going to explore that with um, the yoga tuna ball. So hopefully it's your own yoga tuna ball because uh, we're going to be sitting on it. And so I, th I think in the lecture I talked about um, the perineum. So the perineum is going to be that space between your two holes for those for vagina owners. So between your vagina and your anus. And then for um, the penis owners who are watching this, it's going to be in between um, your scrotum and your anus. So that's going to be where your perineum uh, or perineal body is located. So that's where you're going to be sitting or you're going to place the yoga tuna ball um, on too. So you're going to place that underneath. You can also think, so if you could feel for where your two sits bones are, so you can actually palpate that and feel that, you can also think that um, that yoga tuna ball is pretty much being sandwiched in between um, those two bones, those two sits bones. So position that we're going to um, put ourselves in is we'll start off with in a cross-legged position. So while you're here, so you can just kind of get a sense. Um, just feel for those two sits bones, feel for that ball. If it's, um, if it's kind of uncomfortable, it may be uncomfortable for those of you who've never done this before. Um, it shouldn't feel so uncomfortable that you can't um, sit here. Uh, again, so if you feel like, you know, it's in a spot that it shouldn't be in, it shouldn't be in your anus, it shouldn't be in your vagina. So again, 
um, it should be in that cranial body because that's actually where there's a convergence of muscles that make up those um, pelvic floor um, or the levator ani muscles. So that's where you should be sitting on. And so just while you're here, just kind of get a sense. Um, and I like to do this also even if I'm sitting in a chair. So if you do, you know, this floor-based practice, then you're ready to get back um, to work, to sit at your desk, you can do this, you know, just while you're sitting on your chair as well too. It's a great way just to get a pelvic floor massage while you're sitting, okay? Um, and so you can feel for the right side, feel for the left side, so you can just kind of shift your weight from side to side if you'd like. You might notice whether one side might feel a little bit tighter than the other. I also like to have this be a moment of awareness. So do I automatically hold tension? So especially if you're a butt gripper, and so if you're a butt gripper, then most likely there's also probably gonna be a lot of pelvic floor muscle tension as well too. So can you allow these muscles to relax? So every time that you're taking that inhalation, then those pelvic floor muscles should be relaxed. They should, you know, be um, dropping down. So you can combine this with the breath as well too, that every time that you're exhaling, then you should feel for those pelvic floor muscles in a way kind of drawing back up. So there should be a little bit of movement or buoyancy there. I like to think of the pelvic floor kind of like a trampoline. Um, so, cause there should be some type of buoyancy um, every time that we're breathing. It might be really subtle, especially cause you can't really feel it, but there is actually movement that's happening there on the pelvic diaphragm um, in tandem with the respiratory diaphragm. So you can allow your body just to shift side to side, feeling for any trigger points. You can then also allow your body to come forward. Then you can allow it to tip back. Again, just noticing what you feel. There's no right and wrong. And what I feel in my body is gonna be very different from what you feel in your body. Okay, so, and then you can also do a little bit of a circle here as well. So I like this one. So that way you're kind of almost allowing that your to nerve ball just to kind of like a spoon. I like to think of it like a spoon because that pelvic, that the pelvis is like a pelvic bowl. And then the ball is almost like a spoon, especially then as you're doing this rotation. So it's just kind of um, spooning itself all around um, that pelvic bowl. And then just getting a sense of like, okay, like where are my sticky spots? Where do I need to put a little bit of some focus or attention? Then you can also go in the opposite direction. And of course for me, because my right side is my trouble child. Um, Trouble spots, so uh, that's where I feel a lot of stuff is more on my right. So then after this, again, something that you can also do just while you're sitting in a chair. So then you can also have your legs out in front. So in a long sitting position, so now you might feel a little bit more um, pressure into the perineum. And again, you can play with those same movements, so tilting forward, tilting back. Maybe you're able to go into a little bit more of an anterior, posterior tilt while you're here. Again, going side to side. Again, you can also do um, that rotation here as well. Okay, so, and then again, I like to do a lot of this um, pelvic floor self massage, five minutes, maybe more. So especially if I know that I do have some areas of tension, then maybe up until the point that I no longer feel those areas of tension anymore. Okay, and that can be a nice way just to kind of end your practice. So you can just take that out and then feel, again, I like to do before and after, so I should have had you, you know, or, you know, if you watch this again, you know, feel for how everything feels beforehand, do this pelvic floor massage afterwards, and then feel how it feels afterwards. So I definitely feel like everything just is more spread out, feels a lot more open, uh, that a lot of the tension I was feeling on my right side feels way better. So just note, um, just note what you find, you know, what um, you observe. So hopefully you enjoy this floor-based practice and then tune in to the one for uh, the chair and then also on your bed. Thanks. All right, hi. So now we are moving on to the chair-based practice. So if you don't have time or you're not in an area where you're able to get down on the floor or you know, you're know you not in your bed in order to do some of these things, then there's a great way in order to, again, unseat your seat. 
so that way you can allow for better movements through your body, uh, which will help prepare you for some different um, sitting positions that you can go into, especially if you're having to sit for a long period of time. So if you watched um, the floor base exercise, then as I mentioned, pelvic tilts or click clack is one thing um, that you can do also sitting on a chair. So I'm just going to show that one um, really quickly because we already, I feel like we covered that already in that part. So you should start off just like in a neutral sitting position, feel four or six bones underneath you. Uh, you can just have your hands resting on your knees. So you're going to be moving back into a posterior pelvic tilt, moving into an anterior pelvic tilt. I feel like you don't feel as much of the kind of the click clacking as much um, when you're um, sitting on a chair compared to when you're on the ground. But again, a really great uh, option for you as well, especially if you can't get onto the floor. But this is just, a, again, a good way just to start to get some mobility in that pelvis, especially if you're spending a lot of time sitting like this. We want to make sure, not that we want you to get to be sitting in this position, we want to try to find neutral but just so that you can start to get some movement um, happening here is really helpful. So um, I like to also incorporate the exercise I did, again, where we're just starting to get the breath moving, just getting some blood flow happening um, through the rest of the body, um, especially if you're, if you're just kind of been staying stagnant. So just while you're sitting in that chair, you're not going to be doing too much, obviously, um, with the legs. It's going to be more um, upper part of the body. So you'll inhale to draw the arms up. And then you'll exhale to fall forward. And then as you inhale, then again, you can round through your back. And then you're back up into your starting position. So again, your inhale as you come up. Exhale as you fall forward. Inhale to round and back up to your start. So I'm going to just move through that a couple of times. If it helps, you can always open the legs out a little bit wider. I like it um, so that I can allow my torso to really um, drop down. It's okay if your sit, if your sits bones, you know, comes up a little bit. And it's just a really, I like it almost being like a spinal wave that I'm doing here. So going through a couple of repetitions of that can be really, really helpful. Um, so what we'll do next is uh, what I like to call um, butt walking. So depending on your chair, this is with my dining, um, my dining room chair. Uh, yeah, dining table uh, chair. So not an office chair. So it's going to be a little bit different than if you're in your like ergonomic chair um or uh, your office chair might not have the same amount of depth um, and then most office chairs or ergonomic chairs that i see or sorry not so much ergonomic chairs but i think some office chairs they tend to almost feel like a bucket seat which i think is actually terrible for your posture because i feel like it then just kind of really puts you into um that tucked pelvic tucked position so i actually would prefer you know um, having something where it's a little bit more flatter um, but with the boat walking, what you're going to do, hands are going to be um, on your knees. And I like this just because then you can start to get a little bit of rotation. Um, you're working on, I would say, almost like, you know, isolating the movement of the pelvis a little bit. Um, and then you're also talking to your QL as well. So, um, so that way it's not always just in a erect position, but especially when you're doing that butt walk, that hip has to hike up a little bit. The ribs are kind of shortening on that side. So your side bending slightly, um, maybe a little bit of rotation, but then that's a chance for that QL, that quadratus lumborum, to get a different state of um, tension. So instead of it always being like um, erect and um, on all the time. So you can also just kind of change that state of that muscle as well. So as I do that butt walk, so I like things so like I'm actually really um, pressing down into that one butt cheek as I lift the other one up and walk it back. Same thing, really press that right butt cheek back down, walk it back. Obviously you're gonna go as far as you can, you know, based on um, where your knees stop, and then you'll go forward. So I'm pressing down, I really lift that butt cheek up in order to walk 
myself forward. So my feet really aren't doing, there's no movement really happening in my feet, it's staying still. All the movement is happening in my hips and I'm definitely feeling it all the way in towards um, my back. And so I wouldn't say it's uh, necessarily a stretch, but it's really just to kind of wake up some different muscles that um, might be feeling pretty stagnant, okay? So this one is a great one to do. Um, you can also do this sitting as well too. So if you have um, the space, most people, you know, I have a rug, so some people might get a little bit of rug burn um, when they're doing it. But I like this because it just wakes up that posterior side of my body as well as the side body as well too. So I'm definitely getting um, some oblique action happening here um, for sure. Okay. So then after um, you finish that butt walking, then what we're going to do is a hamstring stretch. So I like doing this. It's a great um, option if you can't get down on the ground. I like to do um, hamstring stretch like up against a wall. So, um, or, you know, a doorway, kind of like doorway stretch. That way the other leg is going, you know, through the doorway and then you have the other leg up on the wall. Again, if you're sitting at your desk, you're not gonna have that opportunity to go and do that all the time. So you can always use your chair. This is not the most comfortable because the edge is kind of a sharp angle. So um, if you have a nice soft angle, it might feel a little bit better. If you need to, you can um, grab a pillow and then just place that because you don't want it to be digging um, into your hamstrings. I'm just gonna demonstrate. So I'm just gonna do it for a short period of time. Um, when you're doing the stretches, you wanna be holding for at least 60 seconds. So you can do 30 seconds, take a break, then do it again for another 30 seconds. Um, so you wanna make sure you're comfortable um, while you're doing that particular stretch. So what you're gonna do is I'm gonna demonstrate um, with that right leg. So the right leg is going to come out in front. I like to make sure that my toes are pointing up so that way I'm getting, again, the whole posterior chain. So feeling it all the way into my calf, into um, my Achilles, down in towards my heel, and even into my plantar fascia as well. And then as I'm here, again, because it is a hamstring stretch, so I don't want the movement to be happening through my spine. So it's not a spinal flexion to actually be feeling movement in your hip. So it's a hip flexion type of movement. And then while you're here, then you should feel a stretch through those hamstrings. So again, depending on how tight you are, um, if you need to bend at your knees, bend at your knees, that's fine, but then the movement should be happening at your hips, okay? That's where you're actually going to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to a hamstring stretch. And again, then you'll hold for 60 seconds and you can switch and do the same thing on the other side, okay? So I wanted to offer um, another option um, for stretching out the hamstrings, but before we do that, um, then coming into figure four. So this is like the quintessential uh, seated pose that I give to a lot of my patients, um, especially with any type of SI, sciatica um, type of issues, back pain issues. So I, I love figure four. I think it's a really um, great stretch for um, the glutes, um, specifically for the notorious piriformis. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna place one ankle and it's gonna come over that knee. So just like if you, you know, were sitting um, at your desk and you might be sitting in this position. So this might feel fine for some folks and you might already feel a lot of stretch. I like to add, again, that forward fold. So then when we flex at the hips, we're gonna get a different action happening um, at those um, hip muscles. So then you're in that forward fold, and you can place your forearms on top of um, your lower leg. That adds a little bit of some extra pressure so you feel a little bit more stretch um, in those hips, okay? So hopefully you can see, and I'm doing a good job of it, but that my spine or my, my thorax is pretty neutral. So I'm not going into a lot of extension, I'm not in any type of flexion, so it's just staying in a neutral position while I'm here because all of the movement again is happening at my hip joint. And then you can always switch again. So with any of the stretches, you're gonna hold for at least 60 seconds, okay? And again, I, I say 60 seconds just because again, um, it's, a, it's a short flow. It's something that you're doing during um, your work break, okay? So something that should take like 15, 20 minutes for you to do, okay? So that uh, should feel a nice stretch through all of those 
rotator muscles um, in your hips, okay? So after the figure four, so I, I said I was gonna show a different variation of a hamstring stretch. Um, for those who feel like, you know, doing this one doesn't do very much for you, okay? So with this next one, what I like to do, so you do have to kind of, you know, tip back just a little bit. So you're tipping back just a little. I'm hugging my knee in towards my chest, and then I'm gonna wrap my arms underneath my knee, okay? So I'm in this position. So then I'm gonna straighten out my leg and then bring it back down. So I can straighten and back down. Straighten and back down. So I like this because uh, it's a little bit more active. The other one, um, the seated one is a little bit more static. This is a little bit more dynamic. Um, as you're doing this, you know, you can point the toes and you can flex the foot. So you can really feel that um, length also the posterior um, chain of your body. Um, I'm, again, I'm hoping I'm doing a good job of this, but you don't want to be rounding through your back too much. Yes, I'm tipping back, but not so much that I'm rolling into like a posterior tilt and I'm rounding through my spine. So I do want to keep a little bit of some neutrality there. And I'm just moving back and forth with this. So for those who, you know, maybe they're all the way over here, so not able to get very far, um, that might also be speaking to how much hip flexion um, that you have available. So then you, if you're starting out here, then you can extend, you can bend, you can hug that knee just a little bit closer, and then extend, bring it back down, bring it in a little closer, extend, bring it back down. So hopefully you're getting a sense of, you know, what you're looking to do. So each time you're bringing that knee just in a little bit closer each time as you continue to um, flex at the hip and extend at that knee. So you can go through about, you know, five um, or 10 times um, with that. And then again, switch and do the same thing on the other side. All right, so now we're gonna come up into standing because obviously if we're taking a nice uh, stretch break, then we wanna be stretching other than just when we're sitting. But this, uh, again, it was like probably about like 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes um, for this, then it can be a nice option um, for you to go and do. One thing that I forgot to mention, um, so going back to that figure four stretch, so I like to add a twist with it. So I'm actually gonna um, do it on this side. So when you're in that figure four, so after you do that figure four, doing any type of rotation is gonna be really helpful for your spine. So on the side where you have your foot, that's where your hand can go. And so hopefully um, you have um, you know, a back to your chair, so that's gonna help to assist with your twist. So you'll place your hand or maybe your wrist um, into that foot and then your opposite hand will go onto the back of the chair. And then you can take three cycles of an inhale and an exhale. So again, with the inhale, that's where you wanna think that you're lengthening through the spine. And then as you exhale, where you twist and go a little bit further. So I like to use the eyes. So allow the eyes to do most of the movement. Where the eyes go, the rest of the body will follow rather than trying to, you know, torque the body into a position that the rest, that the body doesn't want to go into. So if your eyes allow it to follow, most likely then the rest of your spine will also go as well, okay? And then you can reverse and then do the same thing on the other side. So I apologize, I forgot to. Um, incorporate that. So you can do that after um, the figure four um, stretch. So now we'll come up into standing. So one of the exercises that I like to um, teach um, some of my patients, uh, especially if there isn't a lot of movement in those hips, those hips need to move. If the hips are stiff, then that's just like a recipe for disaster for back pain, hip pain. Um, so you're gonna place your hands onto um, the chair. Again, this is another exercise that I got from um, Katie Bowman, um, but also something that you know I've done, um, you know, when I taught yoga. But I like um, this positioning of it. It's a little bit higher. You know, you're not using a yoga block. It's not so far down to the ground, so it's a little bit higher. And the chair is a great um, prop that you can use. So your hands are on the chair. You're gonna open the feet out just a little bit wider. So you're gonna allow your hips just to sway. So it's a little bit of a hip sway. So you're moving them side to side, okay? And so I like this because 
then as I shift my weight to my right leg, that left pelvic bone drops as that right pelvic bone lifts up. I'm getting a nice stretch through the inner thigh of my left leg. And then I can do the same thing as I shift to the other side, okay? So this is, again, really great, something that you can do um, after sitting for a couple of hours just to get some things moving. And so my sits bones, they're pointing directly back behind me. So I'm not tucking my pelvis under, my knees aren't bent. If the hamstrings are tight, then yes, keep your knees bent. But again, you want to keep your spine neutral. So I don't want any tucking of the pelvis. So knees can be bent, but then you can still get that movement. So, and again, if that's hard for you to do, then that's where I would go back to like that pelvic tilting or that click clack. So you can get a sense of, cause even in this position, I should still be able to do kind of like that click clack pelvic tilting position motion. Okay. Um, or legs are straight as you're doing this. So I'm just going to show my butt's going to be to the camera, but just so you can actually see, um, how the pelvis is moving. Okay. So when I'm in this position, as I shift weight to the right, you see my right hip bone lift up the left drops. As I shift weight into my left, the left lifts up, the right drops. So it's back and forth. Okay. So that is the hip sling. So that is um, one of the standing exercises um, that you'll go into. So the second one is to do a little bit of some traction. So you can either use the seat of the chair or you can use the back of the chair. And then you can walk your legs out, kind of like a modified downward facing dog. So you can hold on to the chair, you can draw the hips as far back as you can to lengthen. You can bend one knee, bend the opposite knee, feeling for some nice length through the hips, through your back. This feels really great. Make sure the chair is heavy. So the chair isn't moving as you're doing this. And then lengthen out through the arms and the shoulders. So if um, you're tight through the shoulders and it doesn't feel comfortable, you don't have to go as deep um, into shoulder flexion as I am. I have a lot of shoulder mobility. So it's um, pretty comfortable for me to do this. But if you can't do that, you can just stay right up here and you can still get that nice traction. So we're kind of pushing into the chair, moving your hips back, getting some nice length. And that's still a nice viable option there for you as well. Okay, so that is um, a little bit of some spinal traction with the use of the chair. So the next thing is then I like to then get some movement stretching happening in the legs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place one foot um, up on the chair and then the other foot is going to stay on the ground. Okay, I like to keep both of my feet so they're pretty parallel so it's not like you know, one leg is back behind you and the other one is in front. So they're both pretty much lined up, okay? So then I'm gonna take both of my arms and I'm going to drop them down, okay? So if you feel like this is not doable for you right now, you can always place, you know, one hand on that top, on both of your knees. Maybe you can place them on the chair as well. I like this because again, in a way it's almost like another traction, but with this leg lifted up. So I feel, again, just a lot of um, nice stretch through that right side of my body. I can just allow my arms just to kind of hang down, just allowing it to relax. You can even just shake your head, yes and no. Especially if you're having to spend a lot of time sitting in front of a computer. You wanna give your head and your neck a different, um, different position, different area for it to look at rather than, you know, constantly straight ahead. So even allowing the head to drop down whew, and it feels really, really great. And then you can add some movement. So if it feels comfortable, you can bend that knee that's on top of that leg that's on top of the chair. You can bend it. You can go side to side. You can go in circles. And just explore the movement that might be helpful or that might be needed. So what you need right now might be, might not be something that I'm necessarily teaching. I, again, this is, I give you the foundation for it and then it's an opportunity for you to 
explore even more. Again, this is a little movement bite for you for your movement break. So maybe today this is you know the one thing that you want to do. Another day might be it'll look a little bit different. So definitely just um, feel free to explore with what is helpful for you. Okay. Um, so after doing that little forward fold, I like to think of almost kind of like a flamingo because it's just that um, one leg that's on the ground. Flamingos usually then have like one leg that's tucked up. So you can kind of almost think of it like a flamingo. Um, so then the last stretch that I really love to do, uh, I definitely something that I teach uh, my patients is a nice four-way stretch. Okay. So again, you're going to be using the chair. So, because I've been spending a lot of time stretching out my right, so I'm going to do my left this time. So, my left leg is going to come up onto the chair. So, obviously, I'm then uh, in a hamstring stretch because that is the area that I'm going to be stretching. Again, if hamstrings are tight, those knees, that knee can be bent. So, I'm here, and again, you can place your hands on your hips if needed. You can place your hands on the chair, okay? You don't have to go very far. But then I'm here in this hamstring stretch. Again, you want to hold for 60 seconds. I'm just going to shorten the time that I'm in each of the stretches. So you're going to go into this one. This is the first. Then that right leg is going to pivot. So now I'm turning um, towards, uh, I'm turning to the right. So I'm going to continue moving towards the right. So now that leg, that left leg, the big toe side can be down towards the chair. Okay. And then I can go, I can bend through that right knee, keeping this left leg straight. And then I get a nice length through my adductors to that inner thigh. And again, I can hold for 60 seconds. I can drop, I can, the, I can bend this right knee more and more and more to get more stretch. And then I lift up and I'm gonna continue to turn to the right. Now I'm facing the back of the chair and I'm just going to do this position or you can um, tuck, you can either tuck or untuck, tuck or untuck your back toes and then I'm going to bend both of my knees and then I come into hip flexor stretch. Okay. So if you are concerned with having um, that your knees are over your toes, then reposition. I'm comfortable here. My knee, I know my knee feels safe here, but if you need to, can always bring um, that foot a little bit further out and you can bring it down. I feel like it's a little bit more comfortable with my toes untucked. And then you come into that hip flexor stretch. So you can keep your hands on your hips to make sure that pelvis is tucked as you're doing it. And then obviously I can't turn to the right again. So I'm gonna face, now I'm gonna go back towards the left. And again, do the little hop back to the left. And then, I can even turn a little bit more to the left. And now I'm going to get a stretch on my outer. And then I go slightly down. And then, so this leg that's on the chair, the knee is slightly bent. And I get a really nice stretch. I like to, it's almost kind of like a slightly different variation of like a figure four stretch. Okay. If it feels weird for your knee, you know, don't bend it as much. Um, or just go into the figure four. Okay. But I like this one, especially if you're standing, you want to do some different variations. Then you can even go into this stretch as well. So then you can then start to transition um, to the opposite leg. But also it's a nice one for, um, again, those glutes, for your hips, for all those, all those muscles. Okay. So, and then you can do the same thing on the other side. So some really great uh, exercises, stretches that you can do uh, while you're seated on a chair. Hopefully then get your body moving, feel like you're able to, your body isn't as stagnant or as stiff um, before you have to then go back um, to sit for work again or for school or whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, so um, this is the second part. And then the last part is going to be um, some exercise that you can do while you're in bed, which will be really great. All right, see you then. Hi, so this is the third portion of the unseat your seat. And so this is going to be something that you can do on your bed. I'm using my massage table, um, but it should work um, just as well. So 
What I have in mind for this particular, um, again, 15, 20 minute practice is that uh, if you know that you're going to be working from home or going into the office or going to school, working at your computer, whatever it is, and you're dreading that, then this can be like a little series that you can do as soon as you wake up in the morning, like on your bed, um, in order to get yourself ready to go for, um, for the day. So the first exercise is you're going to be like hanging off um, the edge of your bed. So you'll be lying down. And just be hanging here and then um, you're gonna have your arms overhead so if you're so with this particular exercise so if you have your arms overhead and then your ribs start to pop up then it tells me um, that either the lats are really tight and they're short uh, or there might be also stuff going on with your hip flexors or your psoas so I'm gonna offer some different options um, that you can work with so you can so if you have no issues here then this can be nice and then you can just allow yourself just to kind of hang and just to lengthen. You might even be able to bring one knee up, allow the other leg um, just to kind of dangle and just move the leg side to side. Okay. The other option, especially if you feel like your ribs are popping up or everything is just kind of really tight up here, is to prop both of your legs. And so as I have both of my knees propped up like on the edge of the table or on the edge of the bed, then that helps me to get into a better position um, with my pelvis. I'm still keeping my arms overhead because it's a nice stretch for my lats. And then I can just march. So it's a slow march and I'm just hugging one knee in towards my chest. The same thing on the other side. So I might even then want to just kind of hold, hug that knee in towards the chest. But I like this position just to kind of keep um, everything open um, along the fronts of my chest and get those lats to stretch because especially if we spend a lot of time in front of our computer then they those lat muscles really don't like that okay so you can just kind of march back and forth i'm working to keep my ribs down as well Okay, so just moving back and forth. So you can do this like probably about, you know, 10 times on each side. Okay, and then when you're done with that, and so then after that, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull both of your knees in towards your chest, and then you're gonna do a little bit of a twist. So I might not do um, the biggest twist just because it's a massage table, it's not as wide as a bed, but then you can bring both of your knees over towards one side. You're gonna hook, so I have both my legs over towards the left, my left hand hooks over that top knee, then I can bring that right um, overhead and I can hold. So if my knees are over towards the left, I turn my head towards the right and I can twist. And then you can just hold for probably about three to four breath cycles. So both an inhale and then an exhale. And then after that, then you can bring open the legs out. And then do the same thing on the other side and then hold. And then if your knees are over towards the right, then you can turn your head over to the left. And just, this is really nice, just kind of preparing, getting that rotation. Cause if you're going to be sitting in a chair, you're probably not going to be doing very much rotation here. Okay. So then after that twist, I'm just going to refer to my notes. So after that twist, then um, I like this one because um, as I mentioned, if you watch the one um, where it's like the floor based exercises where we don't spend much time in internal rotation. So I'm going to open the legs out just a little bit wider. So I'm still having my legs propped over um, the table. And then I'm going to have one leg internally rotates or just kind of dropping that leg in towards midline. And then same thing on the other side. And so with this internal rotation here, then uh, again, why like this, especially with that knee bend, so you might feel a little bit of some lengthening along your quads, those hip flexors, um, the TFL, so it's a really small muscle that attaches along the top part of your ASIS and merges to then become your um, IT band or iliotibial band. And so that muscle um, is used, it's an internal rotator. 
So this is um, a great way in order to get some movement in that little muscle that's there. You might even feel some stretch along your IT band um, as well too, and all of the fascial connections of the IT band along um, the lateral muscles of the quads as well as your hamstrings, okay? So with this little practice, we start off a little bit slow and then we'll kind of pick it up um, a little bit. And so then after that, then we're gonna move into a little bit of a pelvic tilt. So I like to do this again, just to start to wake up that pelvis. We're gonna be doing some glute activation exercises um, as well as a little bit of a glute bridge. So it's nice and helpful in order to just get a sense of where our neutral pelvis is. So you can just be tilting your pelvis back and forth. So as you bring it back, you're into that posterior pelvic tilt. And then you can bring it arch um, through your back, moving it into an anterior pelvic tilt. So back and forth into the anterior and posterior, and then finding what neutral is for you. So moving through about eight or 10 of those. And then we're gonna move into a glute bridge. So then you have your feet propped up um, on, whether it's your massage table or on your bed. If you feel that your bed is really soft and that you're not able to get like a really good, um, you know, hold or foothold there, then you might want to transition and do this on the floor instead. But if you feel like you have a pretty firm mattress, then that might be helpful. But if it's really soft uh, or if it's a really old mattress, then that might not be the, this, these couple of actually might not be the best um, in order for you to feel kind of like really solid um, here. So then you're gonna press your heels in towards the table or in towards the bed, and then you're going to lift the hips up, okay? So with this one, you're just gonna move just a couple of times as you're doing this. So the heels are pressing down. As I press the heels down, I'm turning on my hamstrings. As I lift up, my glute muscles start to turn on. As those glute muscles turn on because of reciprocal inhibition, all the muscles to the back of my body are engaging and they're squeezing. So which means that, that I'm also reciprocally lengthening all the muscles on the front side of my body. So I feel my hip flexors, I feel my quads lengthening as well. And you can do that a couple of times. So I would probably recommend at least five or six times just to start to wake up a lot of those muscles. And I like this because then you can take a look at um, your legs and take a look at your hips and then just see whether one tends to rise up a little bit higher than the other. So we want to try to even that out. We're gonna do some kind of glute isolation um, exercises next, okay? So moving through these just a couple of times, moving with your breath. So it's with that inhalation that you lift up, that you're squeezing, and then that exhalation as you come back down, okay? So then after this, so then you're gonna inhale. So you're gonna lift up. You're gonna do another glute bridge, but it's not gonna be very high because the focus is that we're going to squeeze. So I'm gonna start off with that left butt cheek. So I'm going to press both my heels in towards the table. I'm gonna squeeze mostly my left butt cheek. So I'm still lifting up slightly, but it's the left side of my hips that are lifting up. So I squeeze my left butt cheek, and then I really feel for all those hamstring muscles working, I feel for that lengthening on the left leg, and then I can bring that back down. And then I do the same thing on the right. So then I press into my heels, a little bit of a lift, but I'm really gonna squeeze, squeeze, squeeze that right butt cheek. So then it's gonna cause my right hip to wanna lift up higher than my left. And why am I doing this? Because most of us, I would say, especially me, um, but I'm sure there's plenty of people out there um, who are also watching, where there's a tendency that one um, side of your body is going to be a little bit stronger than the other. So I want to, I like doing this as a way just to kind of balance it out. And also every day is different, you know, just based on, okay, like if you're sitting on your butt, you know, pretty much all day, the day before, then those muscles are pretty, um, may, might not be very responsive right now. So just being able to do these um, glute activation exercises, even the glute isolation can be really helpful. And then you're spending all that time sitting, so your um, pelvis is always constantly in a flex position. This is a great opportunity to actively work on um, getting them to extend. Okay, so we'll be spending a little bit more time towards the end of this um, short practice to work on some um, hip extension, okay? So again, you can do this about five times either side. And then I'll do a little bit of windshield wipers. 
Just moving side to side. And then with the windshield wipers, one leg moves into internal rotation while the other one moves into external rotation. Again, a really nice, um, easy movement here. And then I like to add a little bit more. So again, kind of coming back into that glute activation. So as I move into that windshield, so my legs are both moving over towards the left side. So it's gonna be that right butt cheek. Again, that's going to activate, it's going to lift. So it's almost similar to what we did before, but I'm also in a rotation. So I also feel the oblique muscles working here as well too. And then I can do the same thing as I move over towards the opposite side. And then I can squeeze that left butt cheek. And again, getting that extension through on that left side, okay? So this is a nice transition. Again, great way just to kind of turn on um, those glute muscles. So lastly, you are gonna shift into extension, hip extension. Okay, oh, one thing I mentioned, so forgot, is that you're going to need um, your red TheraBand. So if you have the red TheraBand, definitely go ahead and grab that. So as you um, grab your red TheraBand, you're gonna come into what we call a prone position. So I'm gonna place the red TheraBand on my right um, foot. And then, sorry, it's my left foot, left foot, right hand. So it's gonna be contralateral um, movement. So again, using this red TheraBand, we're gonna be adding a little bit of resistance. Um, again, because we spend so much time sitting, so hip extension is gonna be pretty limited. For some people, this might just already be like a lot for them. So they might already be feeling a lot of stretch. But I don't want it to just be passive. So I also want it to be active. So you can definitely hang out here, just work with um, that passive lengthening. Um, make sure that uh, the opposite leg, so that one is gonna be extended. Maybe just have your knee resting so that way you're not putting too much pressure on your knee. Um, so that you can hang out. Um, for about 60 seconds, maybe longer, um, as you work on that hip extension with that knee bent. But then what you're gonna do here with this TheraBand is that as that leg lengthens, so I'm actually gonna be um, positioned a little bit lower. So as that leg lengthens, then that elbow, right elbow is going to bend. And then as that knee bends, that right arm is going to lengthen. Okay, so you're gonna be moving back and forth with this movement. So as I bend that knee, yes, it is active. You might not feel like a huge amount of um, hamstring work going on here, but you know, there is still some activation that's happening. Um, but I definitely feel this, you know, through my arm, through my shoulder, because it is a contralateral movement. I'm also feeling that work along my lats as well too, surprisingly, because those lat muscles, they attach all the way up kind of where your armpit is, you know, a little bit adjacent to your armpit, and then all the way down towards the thoracolumbar fascia, the thoracolumbar area. So it's a pretty big muscle that, you know, you think like, oh, well, it mostly affects, um, you know, shoulder movements or arm movements, but, you know, because lack of use, um, disuse, overuse, whatever it may be, that can also have an impact on the low back and maybe even towards um, the pelvis and the hips as well too. So this is a great one to do. So it can be an active way to get to that hip extension. So you can always start off passive, you know, just with that knee bend and then holding here and then allowing it to be active. So as that knee bends, that arm straightens, as that leg straightens, that elbow bends, okay? So you're gonna be um, working with that. And then the last thing that you're gonna do I'm gonna, and you'll do the same thing on the other side, but as you're working with that, so then you're going to bend this knee, the arm is going to be straight, and then you're gonna roll over onto your side and come into a little bit of a, you're, you're gonna come over onto your side, not so much of a twist, but um, you're laying on your side, and then you're uh, like passively, or actively, I guess it'd be more active, um, coming into that hip extension. So if you're able to see, so that left leg is the one that I've been doing all the work with the TheraBand, right hand is still holding onto that TheraBand. And so that knee is a little bit past my right leg. So, you know, you can have it. So both of the knees are lined up with each other, but in order for you to work on getting more hip extension, getting that leg back, um, but you don't want that hip to be going so far back. So 
I'm working, you can even hold on to the table, so it's okay. You don't um, you don't always have to like try to muscle through everything, but you can you know use that table or hold on to the bed so that way you can try to keep your hip staff as much as you can and try to get that leg back. So it is active. Is even though I'm using the resistance, I have the third band here, but my hamstrings are working really hard in order to also facilitate that hip extension. My glutes are also squeezing here as well, okay? And then after holding that, maybe for about 30 seconds, because it's a lot of work <laughs> with that one, then you can switch, and then you do the same thing on the other side. So um, the TheraBand will be on the right leg, and then you're holding onto it with your left, working with passive um, hip extension, then allowing it to be active. And then you can move over into that rotation or lying over on your um, on your side, coming into that hip extension. Okay, so I like this. This is again a really fun um, way to just get some movement going for you first thing in the morning, uh, especially if you know you're going to be spending a lot of time sitting um, at your desk. Uh, nice 15-20 minute practice. What you can do while you're in your bed, all you need is just a red TheraBand, you know, just for the last portion of it. Don't really need any other equipment or tools with you. So I'm hoping that you enjoy that and thank you again.